بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن والاه My brothers and sisters in Islam السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Before I begin today's topic humbly addressing you I would like to say first and foremost that it is only the qadr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala it is the destiny which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has written for me to be here among you for uh, Sri Lanka was the last country or maybe uh, it never crossed my mind that I would be here subhanallah I was invited by many other organizations and countries and if this tape reaches them they're going to ask me why did you go there and not come here and subhanallah what else can you say except there is a will which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has destined. And there is a reason why I am here before you. I am privileged and honored to be here in your humble country. And I am privileged and honored for you to welcome me here. The brothers have uh, overpraised me. We are all but tools and vehicles of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I hope, I hope from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he uses all of us in his path because al rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said idha ahabba allahu abdan ista'mala if allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves a servant of his whether it be a man or a woman if allah loves a servant of his he will use him or her he will use him or her as a tool you know, when someone gets used by someone else, we say, don't let people use you and step on you, right? We say, don't let people step on you. You've got to be strong and not let people use and abuse you, right? But with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when He uses someone, He is only destining them into the pathway of His pleasure and His ni'mah because He only wants to meet that person in Jannah. This is a reward to meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to be among those. Brothers and sisters in Islam, I ask Allah that He blesses us in this gathering in which the Prophet ﷺ did say that there is a group of special angels. Their dedicated duty is to go out and look for wherever the group of mu'mineen who are remembering Allah, reciting His Qur'an, learning from His deen, and when they find them, they spread their wings. They spread their wings and they encompass them. These are the wings of blessings and mercy. And one of the angels will say, but what about so and so? We can see a person sitting aside, away from the group, from the jama'ah. And they will say to each other, he or she is also listening. They are also part of it. So encompass them as well. Until they depart. And then they go to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Allah asks them and he knows. With which of my servants were you with? And they will say, we were with the servants who were seeking your pleasure. And he says, did they ask me for anything? And they will say, yes, Ya Rabb. They asked you for your forgiveness. And then he will say to them, do they want from me anything in the hereafter? They say, yes, Ya Rabb, they want your Jannah. That's why they gathered. And then he asks them, did they, are they afraid of anything? And they, say, they will say, yes, my Lord, our Lord, they ask refuge with you from your hellfire. And Allah will say to them, my angels bear witness that I have forgiven them. And I have given them what they want. And I have saved them from what they fear. This hadith is sahih. That means that if any one of you, inshallah, have come here with a sincere intention, only to seek the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and you leave, and it happens to be that this was the last of your life. And you meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala after this gathering. Then hope insha'Allah, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَأَنَا عِنْدَ حُسْنِ ظَنِّ عَبْدِ بِي I am the way my servant thinks of me. Then this will be hope for you insha'Allah, that Allah will forgive, have forgiven all your sins of the past, given you Jannah as a reward, and save you from hellfire tonight. And I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the same for me, being among your gathering. My brothers and sisters in Islam, inni uhibbukum fillah. As Allah is my witness, I love you fillah. I love you in the cause of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I hope that you will love me back in the cause of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
for whom I have loved you for. I don't know most of you. And the only thing that bonds us is our deen, our Islam. In Malaysia, when I was coming here, I met a brother who was from Bangladesh. And he said to me in broken English, he says, you people are from Australia, in my family. He says, but I liked you. I said, subhanAllah, we liked you too. He said, not, people, not all people from Australia are like this. He's talking about foreigners, uh, tourists. I said, brother, it's not the fact that we are from Australia. It's the fact that you and I are Muslims. And that even though we met for the first time, it is Islam that bonds us. It is Islam that bonds us. This is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to us in the Qur'an. He made our hearts close to each other. It doesn't matter what color we are, what nationality, what background. And my brothers and sisters in Islam, I swear by Almighty Allah, that if you were to count a ni'mah, a blessing, that is the most favorable for anyone, the greatest gift, wallahi, it is the gift of this blessing of Islam. And you know what? I know that you'll all say yes. Yes, we'll all say yes, and we'll say alhamdulillah, we'll nod our heads. But the fact is, we don't really understand the depth of this ni'mah, the depth of this blessing, wallahi al-azim. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has hadana, has given us the guidance. When everyone else is astray. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us just to thank Allah for this ni'mah of guidance, it is enough. You know why? It doesn't matter how rich you are, or how poor you are, how healthy you are, how sick you are. So long as you are not sick in the heart, then all of this in the whole world, whether it is of good or bad, will soon come to an end like the blinking of an eye. Isn't that true? Like the blinking of an eye. I can see a lot of you here, or some of you here, our elders have already got a lot of white hair. Some of you don't have hair at all. I mean, it seems like yesterday, if I ask my grandmother, how do you feel? You're 80 years old now. She says, Wallahi, Siti, Grandma, that's how we address each other in Arabic. She says, it only seems like I was born yesterday. Ask yourself the same question. Does it not seem only like yesterday that you were 16, 15, 10 years old playing with the children out in the street? Unlike today's children, I don't know about in Sri Lanka, but in the Western world, they're stuck inside their rooms and you don't know what they're doing on their computer. But subhanAllah, this life passes like that, like the blinking of an eye. And Allah tells us about this dunya. وَمَا الْحَيَاةُ الدُّنْيَا إِلَّا مَتَاعُ الْغُرُورِ And this worldly life is nothing but temporary enjoyment that deceives you. And look how Allah addresses it. He says, الدُّنْيَا In Arabic, dunya does not literally mean earth. It comes from the meaning of dana'a or dunu which means something which is low, something which is insignificant, something which has no value. Our Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, الدunya mal'una, mal'unum ma fiha, illa dhikrullahi wa ma wala. The whole dunya and everything that is in it is cursed. It's away from Allah's mercy. Except dhikrullah, the remembrance of Allah, wa ma wala, and whatever follows the remembrance of Allah. So if you are people who follow the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then you are those who are outside of the la'na, outside of the curse. So my brothers and sisters in Islam, my topic, forgive me when I whine, meaning, oh Allah, forgive me when I nag about superficial things. Oh Allah, forgive me when I complain about my health, or when I complain about my wealth, or when I complain about the hardships that I go through. Oh Allah, forgive me when I complain that I don't have this and I don't have that. Because if you were to count the blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you will not be able to count it in number. I was watching a documentary the other day. I don't know if you've seen it. You can go on YouTube and see this. And I showed it to my students when we were studying about suffering in this world. Suffering from a scientific point of view and from a religious point of view. And subhanAllah, watch this young man probably about 30 years old. When he was 18 years, he had a car accident. And he lost feeling in all of his body from the neck down to his toes. All he could do was blink, breathe from his mouth and nose, and speak and hear and see. You know, that's all really a human being needs, right? 
Allah says in the Quran that He made for us sama, hearing, wa basar, and sight. And He also created for us aql, a mind, and a heart, a qalb, which is in here. This is what all you need really for everything. However, this young man, he, is, he was paralyzed from neck to his toes. The interviewer asks him in Arabic, we want to ask you a golden question. What is it that you miss the most? I mean, after being paralyzed, what is it that you wish you can go back, have your body back, have your senses back, and you wish deeply that you can turn back time and have that opportunity to do. He says of the past, he says there are three things which I miss the most. What do you think they are? To be able to walk again and fill the earth? Or to be able to lift food to his mouth? Or to be able to work and gather a lot of money and wealth? What do you think he wants? To be able to come back to be good looking and get the girl's attention? What does he want? Brothers and sisters, I'm not talking about a alim. I am not talking about a scholar here. I am talking about a very simple man who was once a youth, like the rest of the youth. And I don't think this has happened to him because of punishment. Because a person who is patient, then this is a reward action. I'll explain it inshallah very soon. What is it that you miss? That if you can turn back time, he said, I miss three things. And subhanallah, this is from his instinct. doesn't need to think about them. He says, as for the first thing I miss, he said, I miss having my body back because for about 18 years of my life I haven't been able to place my head on the ground in sujood. I wish that I can make one more sajda to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he, where, does, where does this thought come to this person from? I wish that I can make one more sajda to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because I realize how much ni'mah Allah has given us. He said, I say this, but the people around me don't notice this. He said, people don't think like this. Because when you're drowning in distractions, you forget all the ni'mah that is around you. He said, as for the second thing, he said, I miss lifting my arms up. He said, I used to lift my arms up. He said, when I was okay, I, didn't, I forgot to lift my arms up often when I made dua. I wish that I can go back just to repay that time and lift my arms up. And when I was healthy enough, I didn't lift the Qur'an enough. I wish that I can have my arms to lift the Qur'an up so I can read it. And I wish that I can lift my arms up to Allah in the form of the dua which the Prophet ﷺ taught us. Just to come near to my Lord again. He said, as for the third thing which I miss. He said, whenever Eid comes, I used to hug my mother. And when Eid comes now, I miss that my mother hugs me and I cannot hug her back. So my mother, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in the Quran, that the parents are the source of mercy. I wish that I can hug my mother as she hugs me. They asked him another question. And there were young people around him. Brothers and sisters, this is not the only man I'm talking about. This just happens to be one of millions. But this is a person whose heart was guided, whose heart was gifted with the hidayah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I'll talk about that in a minute, why this is a gift. He was asked, how do you feel right now? He said, I have learned lessons that no one on the face of the earth can learn. He said, let me ask you all a question. If one of you had the feeling of wanting to go to the toilet. Excuse me for saying that, but wallahi, even in there is a ni'mah, a blessing. If one of you needs to go to the toilet, to do number two, and you find yourself suddenly, your bowels 
are not moving. You can't go. He said, what do you do? He said, wait a day. Okay, maybe it's the second day you can go. He said, okay, the second day comes. You still can't go. And you're eating. And it's filling up inside. And you can feel the pain. Third day comes. You still can't go. One week. And you still can't go. Two weeks. What do you do? What do you do? He said, get some laxatives. Okay, you got some laxatives. You took the pills. But still, doesn't work. Three weeks passed. You still can't go. And brothers and sisters, I'll tell you from a biomedical background, that if this goes for too long, this goes for too long, your intestines will rupture. And if they rupture, it's toxic. You will die in a matter of three or four hours. Just because of that. Because you couldn't go to the toilet. He said, three weeks passed. What do you do? You go to the hospital. He says, okay, we go to the hospital. And in the hospital, they can't do anything. What do you do? And they're sitting there thinking, what do you do? He said, as for me, for 18 years of my life, this is how I live my life. I cannot go. He said, so I wonder, you're probably wondering, what do I do then? How do I get rid of this feces? How do I get rid of this pain? How do I get rid of this unwanted thing in my body? He says, you know what happens? He says, I have a mother, which Allah has gifted to me and she is with me. She goes through what I have been going through. He says, she brings her hand and she takes it out for me with her hands. He says, all my life, this is how I've been living. My mother takes it out. He says, Alhamdulillah, for the blessing which Allah has given me. The blessing of the parents. The blessing of your health. The blessing of the ability to go to the toilet. The blessing of the ability to actually chew. Brothers and sisters, if I asked you a question right now. We all eat, Alhamdulillah, at least three times a day, yes? Yes? Does anyone go through something called chronic hunger? Like every day, you only eat, you miss out on breakfast, you miss out on lunch, maybe you eat a bit of dinner, and even then it's only a few bites, maybe a couple of breads, dipped in a bit of water. Chronic. Day after day, week after week, anyone here go through that? Well, statistics show that more than 1.2 billion people in the world suffer from chronic hunger, them and their families and their children. Every day, they miss out on breakfast and lunch, and they probably have a bit of dinner, which only a few bites, and some of them even miss out on that. Every single day, they're like this. Orphans. Orphans. The blessing of the parents, subhanAllah. How many, do you know how many are without parents in the world? There are over 200 million without parents in the world. Yet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala looks after them. We, alhamdulillah, have been blessed. And maybe here in Sri Lanka, subhanAllah, because there is a lot of poverty here as we hear about. But I'm here not to... I'm, I'm actually a person who comes from a life where Allah subhanahu wa has blessed me a lot. This is the circumstance which Allah put me. But today, I was speaking to my family and said, SubhanAllah, it is not my choice or their choice or anyone's choice that Allah subhanahu wa puts someone in a particular place. He puts you, I mean, I could have been born to parents who have died and I could have become an orphan. I could have been born in a place, in a land where I have to live under a hut, under a shelter with no walls. And drinking from water that could probably is toxic, that can kill me. Drinking water to kill me. And I couldn't do anything about it. Allah could have made me born into that family. It is not my choice. For this reason, no one is allowed to boast over another person. Ever. And thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for what He has given you. My brothers and sisters in Islam, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does say in the Quran, وَسَنَجْزِ الشَّاكِرِينَ Allah says we shall reward those who thank him and when I say thank my when Allah says thank it's not just Alhamdulillah 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 everybody says Alhamdulillah all the time 
We all say Alhamdulillah. We say Alhamdulillah after our Salat, five daily prayers. We say Alhamdulillah whether we pray or don't pray. We say Alhamdulillah whether we fast or don't fast. We even say Alhamdulillah whether we believe in Allah or don't believe in Allah. But if someone thinks that I come from a Muslim family, I'll still say Alhamdulillah. I went into a restaurant one time back in Australia. Not all of them are halal, right? Entered and I looked at the businessman. He's got uh, pictures of, um, I won't mention because of particular nationality, which are undesirable. He's got alcohol serving. And I thought, subhanAllah, someone brought me there. I asked, I said, brother, is the food halal? He said, alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. He's trying to say that, look, I'm saying alhamdulillah, meaning I'm Muslim and everything is halal. Alhamdulillah on what? Alhamdulillah that I'm serving alcohol, that I'm earning wealth from haram. Alhamdulillah that I am making an environment for something where the shaitan can come in. Alhamdulillah that I am spending my money on haram and earning it from haram. Alhamdulillah only when it involves money, but not alhamdulillah when Allah has guided me to salat and fasting. There are people who don't pray at all, who don't fast at all who don't even have the Islamic character at all in any way. But when it comes to money, Alhamdulillah all the time. Subhanallah. I will recite the whole Qur'an for you if it involves money. Yes? So suddenly I become a good Muslim when it involves ni'mah, blessing, money, wealth. But little do we know and remember that not a single cent of it, not a single bit of it, not a single penny of it can come to us if it wasn't for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who willed it. Allah says in the Quran, "To man tasha wa to man tasha." O oh, our Lord, you lift whoever you want in honor, and you deprive whoever you want, and make them low whoever you will. How many people we know of who became millionaires and suddenly overnight lost it all? Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says in the Quran, "Bada a'udhu billahi min al-shaytan al-rajim." Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. About the nature of the man, how weak he is, and how he or she can oppress themselves. Allah says, يَا أَيُّهَا النَّاسُ إِنْ أَعْضُ بِاللَّهِ شَتَرَجْ بِسْمِ اللَّهِ الرَّحْمَنِ الرَّحِيمِ فَأَمَّا الْإِنسَانُ إِذَا مَبْتَلَاهُ رَبُّهُ فَأَكْرَمَهُ وَنَعَّمَهُ فَيَقُولُ رَبِّي أَكْرَمًا وَأَمَّا إِذَا مَبْتَلَاهُ فَقَدَرَ عَلَيْهِ رِزْقَهُ فَيَقُولُ رَبِّي أَهَانًا كَلَّا بَلْ لَا تُكْرِمُونَ الْيَتِيمِ وَلَا تَحَاضُّونَ عَلَى طَعَامِ الْمِسْكِينَ وَتَأْكُلُونَ التُّرَاثَ أَكْلًا لَمَّا وَتُحِبُّونَ الْمَالَ حُبًّا جَمَّا Allah says, As for the man, as for the human, as for this insan, I will tell you about him. Allah is saying, in other words, I will tell you about him. Let me introduce you to yourself because I created you. As for the man who does not know Allah, in other words. If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tries him or her, by giving them some of his blessings, he will say, my Lord has blessed me, he loves me. Listen to the words carefully brothers and sisters, there is a deeper meaning than what you think. Allah is saying, as for the human, I'll tell you about his nature, the evil nature of human. When we give him blessings as a trial, ibtalahu, blessings is a trial. He, will, he or she will say, my Lord has blessed me. In the sense that, my Lord loves me, I am favored more than anyone else. That mentality. Not the type that says, subhanAllah, Allah has favored me and given me blessings, I thank Him. And I will donate from my wealth and I will remember this. No, not like that. Naturally man, if Allah gives them, they think that Allah has blessed them in a way where they are better than other people. That they love them. And I've heard this many times, there are people, they don't know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, wallahi. But because they have lots of richness or whatever, they say, God must love me, therefore, I don't have to pray much. وَأَمَّا إِذَا مَبْتَلَاهُ And if Allah tries them in another way, فَقَدَرَ عَلَيْهِ رِزْقَهُ He makes a qadr, he wills that their rizq, I don't know if you use that word, qismat, 
their provision is cut off or restricted, he or she will say immediately, Rabbi Ahanan, my Lord has humiliated me. He has left me. And they start saying things like, God is cruel. Why should I worship Allah? Since He has humiliated me and left me like this, this is what happens. He begins to turn away. Rabbi Ahanan, Allah says, Kalla. Oh no. He replies, Kalla. And when you say in Arabic, you can say Kalla, no, in two ways. You can say La or Kalla. La means no. A polite no. Kalla, a firm no. Allah says, Kalla. Never. I do not humiliate people just like that, nor do I give them blessings because for the mere fact that they are better than anyone else. This is not how, this is not how you judge a person whom Allah loves and doesn't love. بَلْ لَا تُكْرِمُونَ الْيَتِيمِ It is because you, many of you, not you, as in humans, do not remember by giving blessings towards the orphans. وَلَا تَحَاضُونَ عَلَى طَعَامِ الْمِسْكِينَ And you are not always striving to feed and look after the miskin, the poor person. A miskin is someone who works but doesn't have enough for their livelihood and usually doesn't ask. تَحَاضُونَ You don't search for them. You don't look for them. وَتَأْكُلُونَ التُّرَاثَ أَكْلًا لَمَّا You consume wealth and money of others like it's a feast. Like beasts gathering at a feast. وَتُحِبُّونَ الْمَالَ حُبًّا جَمَّا And you love wealth so much beyond measure. What is Allah telling us? In other words, the only reason Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tests us when He gives us blessing, and when He tests us by taking away blessing, is in order to fix this disease which we have. When we forget the purpose of our life. Yes, brothers and sisters. When Allah takes something, when Allah subhanahu wa gives us too much, we tend to forget. You know, there's a funny story. Back in Lebanon, this happened. My father told me this story. He says, in Jama'ah, like this masjid, a group of Jama'ah came along. Uh, they were praying Isha' prayer. The Imam prayed, and after he finished, a group of people said, Ya Imam, we think that you only pray three rak'ahs. Another group said, No, 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 I think we think he prayed four. Correct. Everybody's disputing, and then suddenly they, fe- they saw a man sitting aside, not saying anything. They asked him, why aren't you saying anything? It looks like, you know, you, why don't you come in and, and, and talk? He looks at them very wisely, as if he knows everything. And confidently he says, he's prayed for. They said, why are you so confident? He said, he prayed for, I am definite, wallahi, he prayed for. They asked him, how do you know? He said, ah, you see... I run four shops. And in Salat, in the first rak'ah, I've calculated the earnings for the first shop, second rak'ah, second shop, third rak'ah, third shop, and fourth rak'ah, fourth shop. My calculations are correct. I've got no other problems. That means we've prayed for. <laughs> it's funny, but you know what? It happens all the time. And I'll talk about this, inshallah, another topic called what is our priority in life? This man is calculating his earnings by which he calculated his raka'at of the salat. So the world is twisted the other way around. When Allah gives us too much, we forget our Lord even in our salat. And that's what Iblis said. He said, لَأَقْعُدَنَّ لَهُمْ صِرَاطَكَ الْمُسْتَقِيمِ I shall sit awaiting for them on your straight path. In the Salat, I'm going to wait for them. In the Qur'an, I'm going to, meaning when they recite, I'm going to wait, I'm going to whisper. I'm going to make them turn even their worship into a sin. Even their worship into a sin. So that when they pray the Salat, they're thinking of the dunya. When they're fast, when they're, uh, when they're reading the Qur'an, they're thinking of showing off. They're thinking of this thing and that thing. I'm going to make them forget with the ni'mah and the blessings. And Allah says to him, go ahead and bring to them the wealth and the horses and the luxuries of the world distract them with all of that. There was a man who came to the Prophet ﷺ who said, Ya Rasulullah, I am stricken with poverty. For many years of my life, I have suffered from poverty. 
And this young, this Sahabi, he used to come to the masjid. This man came to the masjid. Five daily prayers. Even in Nafils. In Ramadan, he was there in Atikaf in the last ten nights. Always there, remembering his Lord. He said, Ya Rasulullah, can you ask Allah just for one thing for me? He said, what do you want me to ask him? He said, ask Allah to give me some wealth. A Rasul Sallallahu looked at him. Now, you know, when a Rasul Sallallahu looks at a person, he can tell what kind of a person this is and in which state they are better. He said to him, but I fear that if I ask Allah to give you wealth, it will distract you from the good work and the closeness you have with your Lord now. You will lose what you have of ni'mah. If he gives you that blessing, you will lose this blessing. And this blessing is far greater. He said, no, I swear that I will stick to it. So then the Rasul Sallallahu did. He asked Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. And so Allah opened the doors for this man. Allah guided him by granting him a business in sheep and goats. And his business grew. Suddenly, as you would expect, he started to come to the masjid less often. Then his prayers became once a day in the masjid. Then it became only Jumu'ah. Then Jumu'ah was gone. Only on Eid. And then that was gone. Started praying at home all the time. A Rasul Sallallahu asked about this man. And they said to him, Oh, a long time ago, this man forgot the masjid altogether. His wealth and his business distracted him until he had no more time. He has no more time. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that a person whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives too much, what happens to this person sometimes? They say, this is all from me anyway. Isn't that right? It is from my knowledge I got this. It is from my work I got this. I inherited it from my parents. There was a group of, this, is, this hadith is in Bukhari, about three men. One of them had beautiful hair, the other man had beautiful skin, and the third person had beautiful eyes. You've heard this, yes? What happened was, they had a lot of wealth, and they had beautiful skin, beautiful hair, beautiful eyes. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had given them this ni'mah. Allah wanted to test them one day. And you know what a test is? It's not so that Allah can know. Allah knows everything, past, present and future. However, when Allah puts us through a test, it's the test is for us. For you, I mean, test is not to see an outcome necessarily, but rather for you to recognize things in yourself and work on yourself. You know, we put our children through tests sometimes. My daughter or my son, when he was uh, about two years old, he used to come close to the kettle on the table. It was very hot. Now at one or two years old, they don't know that heat is bad. And every time I kept keeping him away, keeping him away, keeping him away, he would want to come. The more I kept him away, the more he wanted it. Curiosity. That's why Adam alayhi salam ate from the tree in Jannah. Curiosity. We have, have, there must be a secret. And the secret must be good. That's the curiosity. But it's only deception. So one day I brought my son's hand close to the kettle. Until he felt the heat. And then he moved it away himself. This test taught him for in later years to come that you have to be cautious around heat because it's dangerous. And the only reason your father, your loving father, prevented you from it is because it will harm you. And the only way you will learn is by going through some sort of trial. We are like children. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is raising us. He's teaching us, brothers and sisters. Wallahi, this is all He is doing. And this is the way we will learn. Why? Because the only way you can meet Him and receive that reward is if you earn it. And Allah helps you to earn it. So these three men, Allah sent an angel to each one. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala took away the blessings from each one of them. The, the skin, the person with the good skin, he became a leper. The person who had beautiful hair, he became bold. And the person with beautiful eyes, Allah made him blind. And he took away their wealth until people start to say, Ooh, these people, they must be very bad for God, for Allah to take away what they have. Similarly, what they did to Prophet Ayyub alayhi salam. They kept saying, this man must be a bad person for God to take away his health, for Allah to subhanahu wa ta'ala take his health and his children and his wealth. But he was a messenger and prophet of Allah. Little did they know. So then an angel came to the first man, the leper. He says, if Allah gives you back your skin and your wealth, 
would you forget Allah's ni'mah and would you give to those who ask the poor and the needy from your wealth? He said, yes, yes, yes. So the angel said, oh Allah, give him back his skin. And he asked to raise sheep, to have sheep as his business. Then he went to the bold person. Same thing. Would you like Allah to give you back your hair and your wealth? And you will donate and give to those who have the right and you won't remember, you won't forget Allah? He said, yes, yes, yes. So he gave him back his hair and he said, I like goats. So Allah gave him goats as a business. The third person, the blind, said, if Allah gave you back your sight, will you thank Allah and will you remember the rights of those who are deprived? He said, yes, yes. So what do you like of wealth? He said, I like camels. Allah gave him the business of camel. He had one camel, then the second, then the third. And the business grew and Allah gave him his sight back. After years and years, the angel came back in the form of a poor man. He came up to the leper who had his skin, beautiful. He said, please, my family is poor. Allah has given you as I see. Donate something of it. I can see that nothing will be depleted from your wealth. The man looked at him and said, go away, I have no time for you. My business, my distractions... He said, but wasn't there ever a day in your life that you suffered at least one day of what I'm suffering? Is it possible? The leper said to him, never. I do not recall. Maybe a few days I went through some sickness. But everybody goes through sickness. He said, wasn't there a day you were poor? He says, poor? This wealth I inherited from my parents and my family and from my knowledge. He forgot that it is Allah who blessed him. He thought, I made it grow. So the angel said, Oh Allah, return him back to the way he was. Now it's a punishment. Before, it was a test. Now it's a punishment. The second person, same thing. With the hair, wasn't there one day that you were poor? Wasn't there one day that you suffered like me? He said, never. My parents, my knowledge, my intellect, my strength, this is how I made it. My smartness. He said, Oh Allah, Return him back to the way he was. Then he came to the blind man. But this time the blind man, who had his sight, he said to him, yes, take whatever you wish. Take all of it, or a little bit of it, or half of it, or don't take it all, it's your choice. For not a single bit of it came from myself. Everything I have is from Allah. The angel then revealed himself and said to him, I am the angel who came to you before. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless your wealth and bless your health and keep you with what you have. Now he has this reward of the dunya and the akhirah. Of the dunya and the akhirah. Whoever said that a mu'min or people, Muslims or anyone cannot enjoy something of this world. Allah says in the Quran, قُلْ مَنْ حَرَّمَ زِينَةَ اللَّهِ لِعِبَادِهِ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ Say, who is it that forbid the decorations of the world and its enjoyments for his believing servants? I never forbid their luxury. Imam Malik, rahmatullahi alayhi, he used to love wearing nice clothing, good clothing. He used to spend a lot in getting it from Yemen. Expensive clothing was sit because he represented the Prophet sallallahu in Masjid al-Nabawi. And he said, this is the ni'mah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala which the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, inna Allah yuhibbu an yura athara ni'matihi ala abdi. Allah loves that the effects of his blessings be shown upon his servants. Not to show off and boast, but he likes his servants to be thankful to Allah by using this and wearing it and enjoying the luxury but not forgetting what they have in rights to others. Like Prophet Ayyub alayhi salam, it says in the hadith that when Allah gave him his wealth back and his health back, Allah made it rain upon him grasshoppers of gold. Gold like grasshoppers. And he kept on gathering and putting into his thawb a lot. And uh, an angel asked him, isn't it enough? I mean, you've got enough. He says, this is the ni'mah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala which I am gathering, not the wealth. This is the gift which Allah has given me. So to thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for what you have, is fine. However, being boastful upon others and seeing yourself better, this is the problem. My brothers and sisters in Islam, subhanallah, al-Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, عَجَبًا لِأَمْرِ الْمُؤْمِنِ Strange indeed is the matter of the believer. In asabahu khayrun, in asabahu khayrun, khayrun shakar. When asabathu darra'a sabr. 
In another hadith, in asabatuh, in asabahu sarra'a shakar, wa in asabatuh darra'a shakar, or sabar. If a believer has good that came to him or her and made them happy, they are thankful. And if bad comes to them, they are patient. My brothers and sisters in Islam. He said, ajab and strange. How come the believer is the same way whether he is given or not given? It is the same. Why? My brothers and sisters, remember this. Anything which Allah gives us and anything which He takes from us is always for a reason. Either He is testing you with a lot of wealth or a lot of blessings or He's testing you with, with lack of it. Or He has a plan, something that's going to happen in the future. Or Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is teaching you something, a reason for you to learn and grow. There was a, a student of mine and I happen to mention him now, subhanAllah, a few weeks ago it happened. He is 16 years old. And subhanAllah, one day, and he loves, he's got a bit of muscles and uh, he likes to, uh, you know, he's got a strong ego. One day I saw him change. And he started coming to me and saying, Sir, can I ask you some questions? I'll ask you some questions. He kept asking me about religious questions. And all the students start saying, oh, so-and-so, you know, he changed, he changed, he changed. And people started following him, because he's a role model, you see. He's a role model in both ways. He's popular, he's cool. So they followed him. Now he told me a secret of something that happened to him, and he was suffering from it. And as a result, it made him come closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So I said, subhanAllah, maybe Allah has a plan out of this young man. One day... I hear suddenly that he had a car accident with his friend. He was the passenger and his friend was driving. The car was what we call a write-off, meaning completely gone. The driver who was his friend only suffered minor, minor injuries. As for him, he was put into induced coma. He had ruptured lungs, internal bleeding, ruptured bladder. And there was a possibility that he will die. I thought, subhanAllah, he comes close to Allah and this happens to him? Suffering happens to him, he comes close to Allah and this happens to him on top? Allah has a reason for it. Allah wa ma sha'a I went to visit him. After three weeks he says, he's crying. He says, I'm, I'm sick of myself, I don't know what to do, I don't know what to say, I, people don't understand, people... So we started to talk for about one hour. His mother was there and she left. After talking and talking about why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala puts people through suffering, he said to me, you know what? My mother, ever since the accident, has not left the side of my bed. He said, now you came in, this is the only time she's left. He said, and at night, when I go to sleep, I can't sleep. I toss and I turn and all these friends I have. He said, the only person I want to call is my mother. He says, I pick up the phone and I call her. He said, I keep talking to her at 1 a.m. at night. 2 a.m. at night. And she's ready at the phone. I talk and talk. And he says, I just talk for two hours sometimes, three hours. Until I'm calm, I hung up the phone and I go to sleep. He says, Wallahi, I never, never assumed my mother to be this way. He said, brother, let me tell you a secret. Before this accident, me and my mother were drifting apart. He goes, I used to go out late at night, come back, and my mother, her and I would have a fight. Fight, 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 until she said to me, son, you are not my friend, I don't want to know you, and I don't care what happens to you. But she's saying it out of love, yes, what how her mother speaks. He said, I go to sleep, and it would kill my heart that I've upset my mother or my father. But in the morning I'd wake up and it's the same thing again. I forget, I forget, I forget, I forget. He started to cry and he said, Brother Wallahi Azim, I have never known how important and valuable my mother and father are until this happened to me. And because he's popular and cool among his friends, his friends went on Facebook. You know, rubbish book? Facebook? Here they go on Facebook, everyone's trying to say, Oh, he's my friend, I know him, I know him, I know him. Trying to get popularity, right? So, when he, 
He says, I can't wait to get out and speak to the people about the value of the ni'mah and blessings which Allah gave me. Look at me, I had muscles, now they're gone. Look at me, I was strong, now I can't even walk. Look at me, look at me, look at me. And he learned these valuable lessons. I said to him, brother, Allah has a plan for you. Something in the future, inshaAllah. And he was, he's getting very high marks. Very high marks at school. I said, brother, Allah has given you intelligence. And inshaAllah, something is going to come out. And you watch and see, inshaAllah. If he will not become a role model in some way. He will tell people things that no one else can understand because he went through it. I have a very close friend of mine. Actually, he's a family of mine. Very close to me. He went through a huge trial. Very bad friends. And as a result, he fell into a very big problem. And he was framed for a murder. He went into prison. Innocent. For one and a half years. Not charged. Nothing. All the friends... All the beloveds, all of those people who happened to be there for him, fakely, were gone. I mean, they call from time to time. Yes, they visit from time to time. But who's going to be there 24-7? Who's going to be there crying? Who's going to be there making dua for him? No one. Mother and father and his sisters are there for him. Again, in the end, alhamdulillah, he was innocent and released. And the first thing now, you can see the bond. He is the only one out of all his brothers and sisters that has the closest bond with his mother and father, mashallah. His sisters and him, very close and values that. My brothers and sisters, we have a topic, inshallah, coming about father and mother being your two doors to Jannah. How closely linked they are to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Finally, my brothers and sisters in Islam, <clears throat> many times Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala takes away things from us. And this is what Allah says in the Qur'an, لِيَبْلُوَكُمْ وَلَنَبْلُوَنَّكُمْ بِشَيْءٍ مِّنَ الْخَوْفِ وَالْجُوعِ وَنَقُصٍ مِّنَ الْأَمْوَالِ وَالْأَنفُسِ وَالثَّمَرَاتِ وَبَشِّرِ الصَّابِرِينَ الَّذِينَ إِذَا أَصَابَتْهُمْ مُصِيبَةٌ قَالُوا قالوا إنا لله وإنا إليه راجعون. We shall truly and surely try you with a little bit of fear in your life. You're going to be afraid sometimes. A little bit of hunger in your life. A little bit of loss of wealth in your life. A little bit of loss of lives from your family members from your friends, from your children, your spouses, and a little bit of luxury and fruits. Give good news to those who are persevering, patient all the way. The ones who when a calamity befalls them, at the time of the calamity they say, Inna lillah, we have always belonged to Allah, wa inna ilayhi raji'oon. And to Allah we shall return. Angels, bes angels bestow upon them. Angels come down upon them. Forgiveness from Allah. On the day of judgment they will say, No fear and no harm upon you. What does it mean? Those who are sabirun, those who are patient at the time of calamity. There was a time of the Prophet ﷺ where a woman, Rasul ﷺ, saw her crying at the grave of a person. So he approached her. He asked her, he said to her, be patient and Allah will reward you. She said, this is my son in this grave. And you don't know what I'm going through. You cannot understand. She didn't know it was the messenger of Allah. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. When the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam saw her in this manner, there's no use talking more. So he walked off. A man came to her and said, that was the messenger of Allah. So she packed up and raced after him. She said, Forgive me, O Rasulullah Sallallahu Wasallam. I didn't know that it was you. So he turned to her, and when he saw that she was ready to learn, he said to her, However, patience really counts only at the time when the calamity has befallen. Not days and months after. Everybody calms down in time. But this great test here, 
If Allah takes something from you, it is at that time. My brothers and sisters in Islam, I just want to share one very important thing with you before I finish. Rasul said, رَطِّبُوا لِسَانَكُمْ بِذِكْرِ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا الله. Always freshen your tongues with the word لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا الله. Always keep dhikr of Allah on your tongue no matter what. Why? Whenever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tries you and tests you, the first thing you will say is the dhikr of Allah. I have a friend back in Australia, a colleague of mine, teacher. He's from Uganda. And you know, sometimes we look at people from Uganda or from different countries, we think they're primitive, you know. But wallahi, we learn so many lessons from these people because from their primitive life, big lessons are learned. Every prophet was a sheep herder, for example. I, we were driving, I was his passenger, and as he was parking the car, he hit the curb. You know the curb? Do you have curbs here in Sri Lanka? When you park the car, okay, they hit the curb on the uh, footpath. Suddenly he said, Astaghfirullah. I said, brother, you haven't done anything wrong, it's okay. I ask Allah for forgiveness. He said, oh, no, 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 no. I'm not, uh, it's not that. He said, subhanAllah, I made a decision ten years ago. Any time I'm startled, startled. <gasps> I got used to saying something that Allah is pleased with. So sometimes I say, astaghfirullah, sometimes I say, subhanAllah, sometimes I say, la ilaha illallah, sometimes I say, la hawla wa la quwwata illa billah. I said, subhanAllah, that is an enormous lesson. At the time of calamity when you are startled, you say, subhanAllah, la ilaha illallah. We were on our way over here, brother Azad would know. And brother Riyaz was with us. And we almost had an accident. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forbid. And I could hear whispers. Subhanallah, la ilaha illallah. Words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. At the time of startling. <gasps> Imagine, if you are crossing the road and a car comes and hits you. You see the car. What would your last words want to, what would you, would, what would you want your last words to be? In the time of calamity. Dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves the servant, ibtalah, he will try you. إِذَا أَحَبَّ اللَّهُ عَبْدًا ابتلاه. If Allah loves the servant, He will try him or her. And I finished it with this beautiful story, true story, that happened in Australia. Why am I giving Australia? Because, brothers and sisters, it doesn't matter where you live. If you are with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and you avoid the haram, and you try to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as much as you can, no matter what He has given you or taken away from, then inshallah you will be on His side. This is for people who want to meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I knew an imam in a masjid in one of the suburbs in Melbourne. He was very, he was from Afghanistan. Very simple, not much wealth, very humble. And he was the fourth imam of the masjid. See, some masjids we have, they, they rotate between several imams. Now this imam, he hardly prays, because usually the other imams are before him. One day in Ramadan, on the fourth day, and let me tell you the hadith before I say this story, Rasul Sallallahu says, إِذَا أَحَبَّ اللَّهُ عَبْدًا عَسَّلَهُ If Allah loves a servant, He will sweeten him. They said, Ya Rasulullah, what does it mean to sweeten him or her? He says it means that before they die, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will beautify their actions and make them die on a beautiful death, with a beautiful end. So he beautifies his death, decorates their end. And think of the other hadith, If Allah loves a servant, he puts him through trials. Put these two together. Those who go through trials and are patient are those whom Allah loves them. This imam hardly prays. One of my friends, he says, I was late to Fajr prayer. SubhanAllah, I woke up a little bit late, I missed suhoor and I made wudu. I went to the masjid and I found that they had already started in their first rak'ah. And they were already in sujood. Everybody was quiet in sujood. So I looked and SubhanAllah, it happened to be the fourth imam praying. You know, the first imam, second imam, third imam were away. They were also late. Qaddar Allah. What are the chances of this fourth imam being praying? 
in Fajr time, in sujood, on the fourth day of Ramadan. Wallahi, fourth day of Ramadan. He said, I came, water is dripping from wudu, coming to join the prayers. Suddenly, he says, I noticed from entering into the masjid and getting into the line, they stayed in sujood longer than usual. So I looked closely and I saw the Imam slouching a bit in his sujood, you know, not normal sujood. But he was in sujood, but so I came closer to him and I noticed the Imam had died. Wallahi, the Imam was dead. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala taken his soul in that sujood. And the people stood up, Allahu Akbar, subhanallah, Allahu Akbar. إِذَا أَحَبَّ اللَّهُ عَبْدًا ابْتَلَاهُ If Allah loves the servant, He tries them. And if He loves the servant, He beautifies their end. My brothers and sisters in Islam, ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive us when we whine. For if you were to count His blessings, you cannot count them in number. For the greatest blessing, the greatest blessing, is to finally meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is the ultimate goal. Whoever's goal is here, very sorry to say, that it will all go away. Because what's worse, to have something and then to lose it, or to not have anything and not lose anything? To have something and lose it is worse. That's why we see groups of people of other religions, I'm not going to mention, they're not here, but Allah mentions them, the Jews, yani, in general. He says, you will find them, لَوَلَتَجِدَنَّهُمْ أَحْرَصَ النَّاسِ عَلَى حَيَا you will find them the most clinging onto this world. Haya. Allah says haya, like something insignificant. Why? Because when you have so much, you don't want to lose it. And when you don't anticipate a hereafter, this world becomes your Jannah. In the last hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, he says, Ad-dunya sijnul mu'min wa jannatul kafir. This dunya is like a prison for the believer, and it is a paradise for the disbeliever. Why? He says, because a mu'min anticipates the hereafter, whereas a disbeliever, generally speaking, does not have that yearn, that anticipation, as what the mu'min has. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to benefit us with what we have learned. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us patience for His greatest reward. اللهم انفعنا بما علمتنا واجعلنا للمتقين إماما اللهم ارزقنا يا رب العالمين من فضلك وارزقنا القناعة I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us from His provision but to also bless us with satisfaction and to make us content I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive our sins to grant us His mercy to grant us the gift of His لقاء of His meeting in Jannah and to make the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم a neighbor to us in Jannah I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we get to sit in another gathering like this under a beautiful tree in Jannah, my brothers and sisters in Islam, so that we may talk about these long days. And I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to relieve any person who is in hunger, any person who is in poverty from what they are in. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to guide whoever is lost, to cure anyone who is ill and sick. And I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept our deeds. Brothers and sisters, thank you for having me. Hada wa sallallahu ala nabina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Wa akhiru da'wana alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Wassalamu alaykum wa rahmatullah.